Well, we just finished up Nehemiah. Uh, it was a great, great book. I really, really enjoyed going through that with y'all. And um, for summer, it's sort of pastor's choice. Um, but that left me with the whole Bible, and so I had to, I had to filter that down for myself at least. Um, and so um, we're going to do some parables, at least. That's kind of what I'm, I'm planning on for this summer. We're going to pop through some parables. And um, if you're going to do one parable, and if you're going to catch um, what Jesus is like from one story, um, for me, that's the prior of all the prodigal son. Um, it is considered by many the, the greatest story ever told, um, which is pretty amazing for a story that only takes like 500 words. Short, um, um, but what's even more amazing is um, that it reflects the relationship that God has with us. Um, and so, um, a ton to get from it. I kind of felt like doing the prodigal son for the entire summer, but I think that would just be a little much. But we're doing it today, so um, it's found in Luke chapter 15. If you want to go there, I'll read it for us, though. Um, a pretty simple story. Jesus continued and said, uh, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so he divided his property between them. And not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, and he set off for a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth and wild living. And after he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. And so he went, and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to the field to, fit, to feed the pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Um, those pods are like the outside of a green bean shell. Like, the green beans were eaten by the people, and then they throw the pods to the, the pigs. And he's sitting there going, man, I, I just wish I could eat the outside of some green beans. That would be so amazing. Um, and then when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And yet here I am starving to death. I'm going to set out. I'm going to go back to my father. And I'm going to say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. And so he got up. He went to his father. While he was still a long ways off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to him, he threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast, let's celebrate. For the son of mine was dead, but he's alive again. He was lost, but now he's found. And so they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on, and he said, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became very angry, refused to go in. And so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I have been slaving for you, never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But then this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, and you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we have to celebrate, we have to be glad, because this brother of yours that was dead is alive again. He was lost, and now is found. Let's pray. God, speak to us your word. Um, we come to you just as that younger son came to his father. And we ask that you would meet us where we're at in our lives and that you would speak to us. So Lord, do that. We love you. Amen. Mm -hmm. um, context is a big deal whenever you read a story in the scriptures. Um, and this one's a little tougher because the context is all the way back um, in the beginning of that chapter. It's the first two verses of the chapter. Um, and Jesus is standing there, and um, what it says is that he was hanging out with tax collectors and sinners, and um, the Pharisees didn't like this very much, and so they, they grumbled and, and said, why is he hanging out with them? He even eats with them. And it triggers three stories that he tells. Um, 
the story of the lost sheep where he describes God pursuing the one that was lost and bringing it back and then there's a big celebration. Um, the lost coin where a woman has lost a coin and she looks all over the house but when she finds it, she throws a party for the neighborhood and says, you gotta come celebrate with me, I found my lost coin. Um, and then this, the lost son, where the son starts to come back but then the father chases him down. And um, I wanna look at the three characters kind of separately and uh, to get at what is it about this father's love and, and how do we get access to it? Like, what does it look like for us to actually have um, an experience of it? Um, the father's love is, is, is unbelievable in the story. It is unwavering. Um, in essence, what the son told him is, I wish you were dead now because then I could at least get my inheritance. And I want to get as far away from this house as possible and so he basically disowns his dad and says, Dad, you're dead to me. Give me my inheritance. I want to get far, far away from you. Um, and yet, when he takes one step back towards God, what we find is the father rushing down to meet him. Um, he's embracing him. He's kissing him. And this son is no longer in good shape. He is, he is a mess. He's filthy and he's stinky. He's stinky. His clothes are in rags. Actually, well, if you could put up that picture, I'm going to get out of the way of it because I like art. Um, but he's tattered. Um, and yet this, this father is, is embracing him and holding him. Um, you ever see like those reunion stories? They come on the news every now and again of like a young girl has her dad back from war after he was deployed for two years or even like a a YouTube video of like a, a dog jumping into its owner's lap. Like we get teary at this stuff. It's powerful emotions that are there of a father reunited with his son that he thought was dead. Um, and there's some things that the father does that we might expect him to do or that he doesn't do. Um, he never focuses on the circumstances of the son when he left. He doesn't go, remember when you disowned me? we got to resolve this thing. Um, he doesn't ever mention that this son squandered a third of his estate. His brother brings it up. Father never seems to mention it. Um, he reinstates him to full sonship. The robe, uh, the finest robe in the house, that wasn't something worn by the servants. The, the family ring, even the shoes, um, those were all signs of being part of the family. What the father does do is slaughter the fatted calf. Um, this was a, an animal that had been set aside for a very special occasion, and um, it is not a dinner for three. Uh, this is not just a family party. The whole community is invited to celebrate with him, the son that is back. Um, it's unbelievable considering how the son treated him and the love that's shown. Um, and then how is the dad with the older brother? Um, this, this dutiful son who refuses to come into the party. Um, actually, he had two sons that wanted to be away from him for different reasons. Um, but he didn't want to be in the party. And so the father has thrown this enormous party. He's celebrating having his son back. And what does he do? He leaves the party. There's joy to be had, but he's going to not be at it because he wants to go out and make sure this other son doesn't miss the celebration. Um, he goes and he makes the effort. He had every right to order that older son, get in here. You're missing out. This is part of the family celebration. You need to be here. And this dutiful son would have gone. Um, but that's not how God is. Instead, he goes out to him. Goes out to him and he pleads with him to come. Um, the older son has a horrible misunderstanding of the party. You kill the fatted calf. You're spoiling the son who acted so terribly. You're just spoiling him even more. Um, but the older son doesn't get that his dad had such joy that he had to throw a party. The son who mistreated you has come home and now you throw him a party. It's almost like he's saying, you know what? You two are great for each other. Neither of you believe in what you deserve. Like, I've been working all so hard and you never give me what I deserve. And then you go and you just lavishly throw a party for somebody who acted like such a churchy. Um, 
and the father has every right at this point to be pretty irritated with the older son. He's insulting his judgment. He's refusing to be part of the family. And yet, what you see is the father pleading with him, come on in. You've got to celebrate this with us. Um, God's love is unwavering, unchanging towards both sons. It's impressive. Uh, this has been called the parable of the prodigal son. Um, but I know at least one commentator focuses on the fact that it's really the parable of the loving father. And both sons miss it. I have been through this story, I don't know how many times, 30 times probably. I know I've preached on it at least 10 times. Um, this week I had a conversation though, and it, it shifted everything for me. Um, and it's through that filter that I'm kind of experiencing the story this time. Um, and what the person said, um, it's just a little comment, and they said, and the only one that's getting in the way of my relationship with God, I think, is me. And it made me start to think, like, what is it about the way that we are and the way that we process life and the way that we process God that really gets in the way of this incredible Father who loves us so much? Um, and this picture came into mind. Um, I think I've used it before with you, so you probably won't be surprised by it, and hopefully nothing will blow up, but we're going to try it. It is the 4th of July, though, so... Uh, <coughs> yes, I love my water. You know I love water. So here's the father, and, and he just pours. And he's always doing this. And as we go through our life, um, at times, we start to do a little bit of that. And maybe a little bit still getting in. Maybe there's a trickle. But a lot's getting lost in the process. Um, and that's the picture. And so, um, <clears throat> nothing blew up. Good. Okay. Um, <laughs> but what is it about about the way that we do things that seems to get in the way? If it's not the Father's love that's wavering, um, what is it? And um, I don't think that's something to beat ourselves up for and go, man, if only I was a little more open to God, somehow I could probably get a better picture of Him. But I don't think that's it. Um, but the story gives me a lot of hope because it points to um, some shifts that can be made, some clarifications that can be made in the relationship. That actually opens it up a lot. Um, when I was a brand new Christian, um, I became a Christian um, after being a bit of a prodigal myself, and then um, within six months, I, I began to feel like, hey, maybe I want to go and become a pastor. I feel like I'm kind of called towards that. And at the same time, uh, my mom had... Uh, recently come out as a gay woman and this is like the early 90s so um, and I remember us sitting down and and her saying to me so this new faith thing that you're doing um, does that mean that we're never going to speak again to each other that to me felt like the craziest thing that my mother could say to me at that exact moment of course not I you're my mom. I love you. Nothing has shifted that way. Actually, um, if I was articulate enough at the time, I would have told her, I think actually my faith is going to help me to be a better son and to be in, in a better relationship with you. Um, but that was just crazy. And as soon as we got that out of the way, we were able to be a mother and her son again. Uh, and I feel like this story gets at some misconceptions, some ways that we think sometimes that get in the way of us actually taking in all the love that God has for us so we can get back to good, um, which is why I kind of called it that. So what about this younger son um, gets in God's way? I want to walk through his story a little bit. He is um, tired of restraint. He's tired of being governed. Um, that's kind of his view of what his dad is doing. And he has that optimistic um, and independent look that sometimes we have maybe when we're at a young age, and, and, and we go, I just need to be free, free to do what I want to do, and then life will be amazingly grand. Um, and what he doesn't know is that by, by leaving, he's going to take himself um, right away from that which is going to give him life. Um, I love Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. It's, a, it's another um, fantastic passage. But here's how it describes life of God. It says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'm going to give you rest. Um, 
Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I'm gentle and I'm humble of heart and you'll find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And what the son does is, is, is in deciding he wants the freedom, he wants to use his resources his way, that somehow the yoke is going to be easier and lighter and he'll be more free to live. And what he finds is that it's the exact opposite. And he heads to, um, perfect description, a far country, as far away as I can possibly get from here. Um, I do not think that is a one-time trip that we make. I think we take lots of trips to far countries. Um, I take far country trips to um, a place of pride where I really just don't need God at all. I take far country trips to um, being depressed, where God is not a factor in my life and can do absolutely nothing, at least according to my perspective. Um, I take far country trips to self-reliance. Um, I do that weekly when I'm writing a sermon. Uh, thankfully, Wednesday was when I broke this week, and I'm like, okay, God, I really need your help. Um, and I always find that life in the far country is not as awesome as it was anticipated to be. Um, now, this, this far country experience, if you've had far country experiences where you went without God, um, the far country experience is humbling, and, it, and it's interesting because um, he gets humbled, but it doesn't make him turn back right away. Um, he uh, decides to work as a pig feeder. He decides to just scrape by. Um, it actually, the term for it, he, he hired himself out to this guy. It wasn't like he answered a want ad. He went to this guy and goes, look, I'm going to die if you don't hire me. I really need this job. Please, 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 please take me in. And the guy didn't really want to. It sort of says that he like glued himself to him. And the guy goes, well, fine. If you're going to need a job here, i got to take you in. All right. You're going to do the worst job possible. And you're going to make so little pay that you never, ever have a full belly. You are just going to scrape by. Um, and it reminds me that we really get to decide how far we're going to go before we decide to turn back to God. He scrapes by for a while. Um, and we can go without God for quite a while, um, but we will just scrape by. But then there's the term of, of turning. Um, it says he came to his senses, or actually, literally, he came to himself came to who he was made to be. He came to the clarity um, of who God crafted him to be. And he decides to do something about it. There is these moments where we go, oh, if I stay here, this is not going to keep going well. We get these little moments of just clarity, and we get to make a decision, what are we going to do? Um, and he says, you know what, I'm going to go back, but I've really, really blown this. I'll go back, and he, and he starts to work out a deal. You ever try to make a deal with God? If I, if I do this, you do that, and somehow that will somehow work out better for me because it'll alleviate this situation that I'm in. So he's, he's working out an arrangement because he's pretty sure his dad's not going to actually help him out. He really did disown him. It's not a good thing. So he says, I'm going to go back. Um, dad sometimes hires guys who are hungry and in need. Uh, He's not going to take me back to his son, so, but, he, but he's a pretty generous guy, so I'll just go back and I'll be like one of those guys who shows up at the farm and really needs a job, and then maybe he'll hire me on as like a seasonal worker. So he's heading home, and in the process, um, he has no expectation of God's love or grace. None. Um, not worthy to be your son, make me a servant. And he's kind of rehearsing it over and over again and hoping that would be enough. He's, he doesn't have a lot of merit to rely on at this point. He doesn't have a lot of his own goodness to rely on. And so he's going to go work this deal. Maybe it's just enough to get him in the door. Um, maybe if he does everything right, he does a really good job as a hired servant for the seasonal work. Maybe his dad will keep him on for the next season, and at least then he'll eat decently. But then it says while he was a long way off. It's almost as if his dad is looking out the window, going, oh, I wish he'd come back. I wonder what happened with that boy. And then as soon as he sees him, he rushes out to meet him. He has compassion. He feels his pain. Um, 
he hugs him, he kisses him, and he and he asks for the servants to bring the best clothes and the family ring and the shoes. Um, he doesn't berate him for how he messed up. Um, he just sees his beloved child who's hurt him. Um, and it's this comical scene at that moment because he's the son is trying to rehearse the stain that he's been preparing. Father, I'm not worthy to be your son as the son is going, my gosh, son, you're home. Yeah, but I'm not worthy to be your son. I'm, uh, I got this deal worked out, hired hand. That's what I'm shooting for. Meanwhile, he's being dressed in the family robes. Um, it's almost like the son doesn't get it. And when we come to God, if we are focused on our mistakes, how we've blown it, what other people have told us about how we're not worthy, um, about our, our low view of, of who we are and must be and God's perspective of how we've disappointed God um, with, a, with anything less than the fact that we're dearly loved sons and daughters who are incredibly precious, so much so that Jesus would lay down his life. If we don't accept the grace, we have a distance between us and God. I'm not, not worthy. Uh, servant functions within like the rules of the game. You know, your job, you got policies and you gotta follow the policies in order to keep the job. That's how that works and, and it's a very distant relationship. Um, and we can live meagerly as hired hands with God if, if we refuse to be called his sons and daughters. We put up a wall. I know at times uh, in my own life I go, man, I am not near as awesome as I thought it was going to be. Uh, I'm not near as successful as I thought I would be at this point in my life. Um, and then I see Christina come in the door and I'm like, wow, she really blew it. <laughs> she blew it in picking this guy. Now if that evening I am carrying that into our time together, you know what, Christina, you'd probably be better off if I wasn't here. There's no way we can get close. There's no way we can be in this together. And I think sometimes we do that with God. We go, man, I, I, I'm not worthy to be it, so it must not be. Um, and we miss out on God's love. And then we, um, we don't live the life that we wanted. It's kind of ironic that the younger son finally finds the life he wanted when he finally comes home, too. Um, he wanted to go party, right? What's better than a celebration with all the family, friends, the fatted calf, everything um, right before him, with his dad, the finest robes, all the stuff that he wanted by running away, he finds at home. Um, may God break us of our unworthiness. May God break us of too low a view of how much he loves us. We underestimate him terribly. Um, may we grasp as Ephesians says how great and wide and high and deep and broad is God's love um, may we take one step towards realizing how incredibly loved we are how much grace God has for us and how much God wants to do in our lives one tiny step in that direction and we live a little bit more fully what about the older brother, though? We'll go quick through him. He has this, this uh, dutiful sense of things. Uh, he does the right thing all the time. Um, and he has this also low-grade anger underneath it. You ever experienced that? Where you're doing everything right, but there's like this... It's carrying stuff over. It's, it's getting a little bit frustrated. And finally, uh, his brother comes home, and he just blows up. I have been out here working my tail off, doing everything right, and not getting what I deserve. I deserve as big a party, if not much more so, than the son who went off and blew it. Duty is a ruthless master. Duty will kill love every single time. Imagine if I am driving home uh, from work and I, I stop by QFC to get some eggs, and then I see the flowers and I go, well, I should probably get some flowers for Christina. Um, I am her husband, after all. 
So I go get some flowers and then she comes home and is like, oh my gosh, you got my favorite flowers. And I say, yeah, well, it's my duty. I'm supposed to, it's my job. Um, and actually now that I gave you these, your job is to cook my favorite meal. <laughs> I mean, I did buy her flowers. She did cook me her favorite meal. There is not a lot of love there that night, I'll tell you that. Um, duty will kill love. Um, and religion is really good at duty. Uh, we get a lot of shoulds and oughts piled up and we lose a lot of relationship. Um, and if our relationship with God is based off of the oughts and shoulds, it will kill that love. Um, and the other trickle-down effect of that is it will actually kill the love that we have towards each other. Um, notice the older brother. He doesn't say, my brother came home and then you threw him a party. He says, that son of yours, and he doesn't say returned. That son of yours came. He has totally written off his younger brother. He is dead to him, actually, the way he talks. And the father corrects him. He says, your brother <coughs> was lost, but now is found. Was dead, but now is alive. We have to celebrate. Um, and then he challenges him to have the same joy that he does in celebrating his brother. Um, he invites him into his own view of this other person, his brother. The elder son in the context of the story is the Pharisees who are grumbling at Jesus for hanging out with these sinners. Um, and they had lived out a very dutiful religious life. They did everything right. They followed every rule um, and what it produced in them because they didn't do it in view of God's grace and his love was a self-righteousness and a pride and a critical, unloving and unforgiving spirit. Um, and this absolutely terrifies me because it means that if we do this following Jesus without the relationship part, without the grace part, we can do all the same stuff as we would normally and end up going in the exact opposite direction. Totally the opposite of God's love and ending up facing um, in a really, really harsh way towards the world. Um, and this has happened time and time again. Um, folks end up standing up for God's values and his goodness, but end up standing against God's love that he wants to show towards people. And the truth of our situation is really that we're all forgiven. We all need grace. And the differences between the best of us and the worst of us in any given place is really not that much compared to the holiness of God. Uh, it's a small, small degree. We're all sitting at a place where we have been welcomed home as prodigals. Um, may Harbor never become a place that's like that. May we never become religious people who decide that there is an other that we are not connected to. Um, it is mind-blowing what Jesus did with these Pharisees in this story. He basically told them, you know those, those tax collectors and sinners that you're grumbling about me hanging out with? That's your brother and your sister. Come celebrate it. That absolutely blows our minds. Who is our other? Um, is it political? Is it a lifestyle? Is it any number of others? Um, we have a way of finding others in our lives that's I think something that we hold very dearly to is it, it gives us a lot of energy to figure out who we're against. Um, and what if we actually stopped and said, well, let God's love lead me in how I'm going to treat them because that's my brother and sister. It affects the family. So what do we do with this? I think there's two things. I think there's two shifts that would open us up to what God wants to do in our lives. Two um, little things. And one is, um, no matter where we are, with our understanding of God, with our relationship with God, recognize that at least at some level we have greatly <laughs> underestimated how much God loves us. 
Wherever you're sitting, you know that no matter how well you've screwed up or how well you've done, that God loves you way more than you think. There is absolutely nothing we can do, good or bad, to make God love us any more than he does. Because he loves us way more than we could ever imagine. That's the starting spot. So may we be people who remind ourselves, remind each other, God loves me a whole lot more than I think he does. The second thing is that we underestimate God's love for other people. That's just a fact. Um, that other, whoever that other is in our lives, um, is just as loved. And um, so much so that Jesus laid down his life for them just as he laid down his life for us. Um, so may God's love lead us in how we think and how we treat and how we live with the other. 